I'm Steve Backshaw, and you're listening to the Aussie Wildlife Show. Hey guys, welcome to the Aussie Wildlife Show. Adrian here, and I'm here, of course, with Steve. Good day, guys. And we're very lucky today to have with us Catherine Tuft, Chief Executive at Arab Recovery. Welcome, Catherine. Hello. Um, thanks so much for coming on the show. And just for the listeners, we had Nathan Beacons on the show a couple of years back um, from Arab Recovery at the time and had a good chat with him. And um, what's been going on down at Arab Recovery since we uh, had last caught up with you guys? Oh, quite a bit, really. There's always a lot going on. Uh, one thing that's happened since then is we've now got quolls well and truly reintroduced and doing their thing and giving us headaches in various different ways but uh, we love them anyway <laughs> they're still my favorite animal quolls <laughs> love quolls so the western quolls what you had a few headaches mm. with them you say so i guess in we're one of the first well we are the first fenced reserve to bring western quolls uh into a, a large reserve like ours how big is our recovery so to go back we should step. go on to that yeah it's twelve thousand hectares is that big so enough for quolls well, that's what we're finding out. So, yes, in terms of them surviving and supporting a, a self-sustaining population, maybe not in terms of them being genetically viable in the long term, unless they can establish outside and there can be some movement in and out of the fence. So we're really interested to look at that. And we found so far that the quolls are definitely dispersing out of the fence. There is a level of survival out there. It's not complete, but some are surviving. And they do climb back in, some of them. So... There's potential if we can keep on top of the feral load outside that quolls might actually survive in a bit of a halo around the fence and uh, and then they'll be able to persist that way and spread out even more. How do the quolls fare against things like cats? Are they just no match or...? Uh, they're better match than some more vulnerable things like uh, betongs or bilbies that we have in the reserve. Uh, big male quolls will give a smaller cat a run for its money uh, and, in fact, quolls, I think, can be a major predator of kittens and, and little cats so they, there's a bit of competition there um, but they are still vulnerable to cats where they reintroduced quolls into the flinders one of the main things they had to do was to get on top of the cat predation for the quolls to persist and start breeding so it, it is not quite an even fight yeah they knocked them around first up didn't they the, the cats yeah it was yeah. looking pretty sad for a moment they did yeah but um i guess it was a good lesson that like we were able to understand the extent to which cats were a problem how much management was needed to keep the quolls going and and they're doing great work there now and expanding further out and we're talking about the um western quoll which is not a massive quoll not like a tiger quoll yeah it's somewhere between a tiger quoll and an eastern quoll so yep. yeah it's a, a decent size and they were the most widespread ones so they were right from western wa all the way into uh, corners of new south wales and victoria and so on so they were right across most of the country so you guys have got them at arid now near roxby downs and also that eight years ago they were released in to the northern flinders and then one turned up all the way over at the um Gawler Ranges. Yeah, that's so fascinating. Um, it's, it's like nearly 300 k's away. Yes, that's kind of a roughly equal distance between the Flinders population and ours at Arid Recovery, so we would love to know where it came from. We don't know. Is it one of ours? Is it one of theirs? Yeah. Um, we've been trying to look through uh, our camera trap images to see if the spot patterns line up with any of the quals that we've got, and they've done the same with the Flinders, but it's... Uh, still the jury's out we're not sure where it came from that sounds like an arduous task that's not a computer generated thing either no. you have to sit there Assist, it can be computer assisted but it takes a bloody long time okay. <laughs> yeah so it's interesting how you talked about them coming in and out of the fence so we know mm. based on the reintroduction program that they can survive if we work you know to control cats and foxes yes. um, but i like that concept of having that twelve thousand hectare area where they can be able to breed without the predation absolutely and, and that's a lot of what Arid recovery is about. We um, like we might be one of the earliest and the, the largest of these fenced reserves, but you know, they come with their own challenges. Expensive to maintain. Um, you are actually limiting uh, the, the wildness of animals and their their behaviours when they're stuck within when they're contained within a fence. So we're working on strategies to get some of them outside, and if we can use that fence and animals that will actually disperse out of it of their own accord, it gives us a real opportunity to do that. So we've been doing lots of work lately. Yeah, well, one of the things that we're working on at the moment is trying to connect with the partners outside the fence. So at the moment, most of the properties around the reserve are being managed by the uh, Kukuta Aboriginal Corporation. So they're looking after that country, developing a range of program. So there's a real opportunity for us to work with them, controlling cats, working on 
looking after foxes and getting rid of all those threats so that we can improve the chances for quolls and other things that spread out. It's so exciting, isn't mm. it? That's what it's all about. Um, so originally the quolls would have been bred by Percy, most uh, of them? Yeah, so actually most of our quolls came from the, the wild, from Western ah, Australia. Okay. Uh, some of them came from the Flinders Ranges, so we, we'd always preference wild to wild animals. The outcomes tend to be better. Um, but that's not always possible. So sometimes you do need to have that captive staging period just to get the numbers up and not to impact wild animals. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I just wanted to do a shout-out for zoos. I know that a lot of people are like, oh, animals in captivity, blah, but, you know, flip it around to say, well, what are the positives that are going on here? And that's mm. obviously one of them. Absolutely. And you can also learn a lot about animals in a zoo environment that you can't do so easily in the wild. You can test different techniques, how to fit a collar on an animal safely and that sort of thing. So, yeah, they're hugely important. Yeah, I think uh, Adelaide was involved once in a, a nesting box for the Kangaroo Island Dunnart, which is the rarest mammal on the island, um, but they using their fat-tailed Dunnarts to see what boxes they might use, like a nesting box, like a terrestrial box. Right. Um, and they found that the boxes with more than one hole, they were, they were more inclined to use because they had that huh. escape route, which I thought was interesting. That was learnt from having captive animals that's cool yeah interesting actually it's a bit of a segue there we're um connecting i'm going out to monato tomorrow um to visit the stick nest rats that have got in the enclosures there and we're working on this little project to see if we can help the stickies get underground where it's cool um we've had some dramas with our stick nest rat population in recent years we think partly due to heat waves they're struggling in the really hot summers when it's exceptionally hot they're an animal that nests above ground, unlike a lot of the other arid animals that burrow, so they're more exposed. And we'll know that, we know that they do go down the burrows of other animals if they're available, um, but they're, they're not always the case. So we're seeing if we can construct burrows for them and testing whether stickies will use them, what are their thermal properties, and working with an artist out of Tassie who makes, she makes art for wildlife. Uh, so she's making these little terracotta tubes for us that we're testing uh, to see if they're going to help the stickies out. That's a fun little project. Mm. That's really interesting. Yeah. When, when Nathan was on, um, he said you guys only had one stick nest rat at that point in time and it was one male. But I believe there's a couple of islands off Sejuna where they're, they've been released to. So yeah. you can get um, them from perhaps. That, that's right. So the, the stick nest rats were wiped off the mainland when the cats and foxes and rabbits came through, but they survived on islands off Sejuna and they've been released to a few other islands of the Air Peninsula and um, more sites around the country now. So there are places to source them from. Um, we just have to make sure the place is ready to receive them and they'll get the best chance of survival. So hopefully soon. And these, and these, these rats, these native rats, they carry sticks with their face and their hands and they construct that big nest, which Nathan said can be up to six cubic metres or something. And is, is that to provide like insulation from the sun because they don't, Burrow as yeah. often you're saying. Um, I, we've been testing the thermal properties of nests, and they really provide very little insulation. It's hot in there when the sun's. I know. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> that said, you know that there's an awful lot of creative stick nest designs. So we've found some of them will be built into vegetation, which gives them a bit more shelter. Sometimes they'll be built into rocky places if you've got an environment with uh, little cliff shelves like jump up country uh, or even where we've had burrow pits um, from machinery constructing roads and there's been piles of rocks on the side. The rats will build in there. Mm. Um, it might just be they like the look of it and it's easy to build around rather than starting from scratch, but it, it probably gives them the thermal advantage too. Okay. Yeah. And you've got bilbies on the property and you've got burrowing bedong, so there mm. should be some burrows for them to use, but is it because there's... They're being used already by the bilbies and the bedongs, perhaps. Yeah, that's right. So um, there could be a bit of competition for burrows, and um, we're also looking at moving stick nest rats to other parts of the reserve where the vegetation's in better nick. Um, it, it's really suitable for them, where there might, might not be other animals that are burrowing and enough space for them to get underground. So that's okay. the idea. Mm. So you're confident you will get them to go underground? We know they do, yeah. yeah. So we've... Um, we've seen with camera traps and radio collars that they do go underground when it's hot so uh, I, hopefully if we build it they will come but mm. that's where using testing in the captive facilities at Monado and elsewhere will be handy so we can be a bit more sure. That'd be good mm. yeah. Mm. So they did exist out there originally? Yeah well that's a big question so we're thinking a lot about 
climate change and the arid zone uh, and what it means for fenced reserves too. Uh, and, and one of those, I guess one of the canaries is the Stickness rat. It, uh, it was right through the arid zone, sort of up into, nearly into the tropical areas. So they did persist there and um, would have been through some pretty hot times. But what we don't know is whether they would have contracted back to refuge areas where there was a bit more moisture, a bit more food and maybe some thermal protection for the nests and then expanded back out when times got better. So we're seeing if we can put those refuges within the reserve because obviously they can't go anywhere once they're in a fence. Uh, so we might need to bring those refuges to them. And we're thinking the same along the same lines for bilbies, betongs and, and other species um, in terms of provision of water. So in really deep droughts, uh, the animals can't travel the way they would have across the landscape so we're working on putting out reticulated irrigation to put just a bit of natural water simulating a bit of a storm cloud dump so that they've got something to to live off in those tough times. Do they find the the land easy to dig like burrow and betongs and that? Yeah um, so the, the land there is composed mostly of dune fields and then big hard clay flats in between uh, and the burrowing betongs and the bilbies they're really good diggers so they'll they'll dig in the clay a bit harder work um, but those burrows are more stable um, and the sand ones will collapse more easily if they're not used but yeah plenty of room for them to dig around and uh, the place is just full of holes if you walk around you often fall in them <laughs> so yeah, wow. you've got to watch your step so they can i mean we we get an auger to drill holes in the ground to put a post in and that's hard enough but they can uh, actually yeah. dig through that clay yeah. that we struggle to dig through Absolutely. with machinery four hours it took us to dig six holes <laughs> yeah. through the clay here <laughs> But those yeah. little things mm. manage to get through it. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah, and you know what's really cool is that um, rabbits, are, they're not up to the task to the same degree as an animal like a burrowing betong. So I've heard that um, in places like the Flinders Ranges in Cow Creek country, which is where you get this sort of really hardened top layer of the soil, it's almost like rock. The burrowing betongs dug through that, established warrens, same as um, here in those wombats do, and rabbits have moved in and occupied those holes but if you rip those warrens and, and destroy them the rabbits can't reopen them and that landscape's useless for the rabbits from then on so that that's kind of a neat technique so hats off to the burrowing betongs for coping with some pretty tough ground yeah wow. a rabbit wouldn't try to displace a betong because betongs could be pretty ferocious or would they i don't know actually how that would go but uh i guess they they effectively displace betongs by Sheer being number. able to live with yeah sheer numbers <laughs> they can cope with the cats and the foxes that the betongs can't cope with and, eating all yeah. their food yeah competition for food yeah mm. that's the thing isn't it like they, rabbits evolved alongside cats and foxes mm. for millennia and the mm. betongs didn't no, no are we no. seeing any changes like the placentals have always seemed to have had the advantage over the marsupials but have we seen any any changes in that like have we seen like some the marsupials evolving in any areas to adapt or yeah um Do I mean we, we're yeah. We're doing a lot of work in that space, led by our principal scientist, Catherine Mosby. So she had the brainwave a few years ago to, rather than just focusing on clobbering the ferals, to try to give these vulnerable mammals a chance, looking at can we make the, the natives tougher? Can we give them a better chance against the ferals? Is there potential for a level of coexistence? Um, so it kind of started uh, several years ago at Arid Recovery where they they did these bilby releases outside the fence into an area where the, the cats were reduced but still there uh, and they trained half the bilbies to be scared of cats by holding up a stuffed cat, uh, pulling the bilby out of the bag and then spraying it with cat pee and uh, giving it a very unpleasant experience associated with cat smell and what hopefully looked like a cat. <laughs> uh, and it, uh, there was a little bit of a difference in, in how those bilbies that were exposed to the cat survived outside the fence. They were more, I think they moved burrows more often, so they were a bit more cautious in that regard, but ultimately didn't survive. Uh, so the next step was to try a more real exposure and over the long term and over generations. Uh, so the, this project's been running for, I guess, nearly nine years now trying to actually expose both betongs and bilbies to feral cats in a controlled way and allow them to learn the cats are scary and to actually accelerate that evolution um, to fast-track the natural selection for smarter bilbies and smarter betongs that recognise cats as a threat. And, the, of course, the implication there is that the ones that don't get eaten and don't breed, whereas the ones that do go on and have more babies and 
uh, eventually we'll have super bilbies. Maybe. That's exciting. <laughs> One sec. That would be such a um, hard project to work on because you're kind of putting animals in danger to learn stuff like that. That would be so hard. Yeah, I mean, it, it took guts and, yeah, pretty impressive of Catherine to get it off the ground. Yeah. Um, but by the same token, the alternative is animals that will be stuck on predator-free islands or in fenced reserves um, for the foreseeable future, um, or that there'll be more attempts to get them outside that will fail and more animals will die as a result. So I think yeah, it's it has definitely to be worth, worth trying. Yeah, worth the effort for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and you can be careful to control things. Um, originally, the cats that went in were desexed, so that uh, there was no risk of um, them breeding up and, and getting out of control. Yeah, they said that on Jurassic Park too, though, didn't they? <laughs> yes, well, actually, later we had to put more cats in because they weren't putting enough pressure on the, on the prey population. So it was uh, a bit of a balancing act and takes some pretty close monitoring. So you're pretty excited about the future of some of our native mammals? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of, one of the things that gives me an awful lot of hope is there's just so many good people in the game. Uh, and more and more coming through that care about this stuff and are excited to get stuck into it. Uh, and, and there's some cool science coming together and good collaborations, so I think the future is pretty bright. Um, I do think that we've got some big challenges on the horizon as we look at what climate change will do to ecosystems, um, but there's a lot of really creative thinking happening. So hopeful, hopeful. I'm really saying that since doing this podcast. There's so many different... Um opportunities for, for people, young people that want to get involved mm. and help the environment. And once upon a time you could plant a tree or work at a zoo, but there's there's all like you say, all this great science in, in the ecology yeah. world. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. So we, we take on a lot of honors and PhD students and interns and other traineeships. We've currently got a, a graduate program running for climate change adaptation research. So we've got a the aptly named Jack Bilby working for us, his real name. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah we really excited to see what all of these young minds can produce. That, that's really good. Um, now, your PhD, just to take a sidestep from the <laughs> arid country, that was on brush-tailed rock wallabies, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Yeah. yeah. You want to talk a little bit about that? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, I became an expert in locating rock wallaby poo. <laughs> 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 I was very fit climbing around mountains in western New South Wales at the Warren Bungles and parts of the New England area. And uh, my, my question was looking at what um, what resource-based threats are operating for the, the species? Are they unable to get access to good food? What's driving that? Can we do little burns that are going to improve the food available to them? Um, and, and how do they balance the risk of going out to get food versus um, being exposed to foxes and stuff as they leave their little refuge areas? So, yeah, it was good, good times. They, they generally, like, just looking at the yellowfoots and the flinders, they had, seem to come down at in the evenings from the, their safety of the cliffy areas yeah. to where the grass is down the bottom. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, most, most rock wallabies will have this little refuge area uh, and then each night they have to poke their way out as far as they feel safe and uh, depending on where they are and what the risk of predation is out there in terms of foxes and other creatures around or how much cover there is, they'll be more prepared to go further and so forth. So, yeah. Foxes are the, is the big one for the, the larger rock wallabies, isn't it? It really is, yeah. I think there's some records of cats being a bit of a threat to rock wallabies, but they don't appear to be a major limiting factor in most cases um, for, the, for those larger rock wallabies anyway. Little tiny monjons up on the Kimberley might be another matter, but uh, they've got some pretty neat habitat that gives them a lot of protection. And you worked with them too. We spoke about them on the last episode. Um, they're like a one kilo rock wallaby. So tiny. Yeah, the world's yeah. smallest rock wallaby. Yeah. And they were only... Uh, discovered science in the 60s. Yes, yeah, so like 50 years ago, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah very recently. So, That's uh, insane. They were still finding like a mammal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. 50 years ago or 60 yeah, years ago. Yeah, absolutely. And there's been very little research done on them still. They're just in some super inaccessible areas, really hard to get in there. Uh, and it's tough work climbing around those rocky places. We, I had a student that we worked with who studied the goldenback tree rat and um, the wyulda, the scaly tail possum up in that country and she would be dropped in in the wet season for two months by helicopter, would just live under a tarp, <laughs> radio track all night, she'd get a resupply at the two week mark or maybe at the wow. one month mark and that was her life. So it's hard going out there. That so. sounds like a dream life but I bet that would have been so hard <laughs> like going out to the Kimberleys I'd be looking for rough scale pythons all the time but 
<laughs> that, yeah. yeah, that would get old. Character quite. building. Quick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, wow. she's got loads of character. Rosemary Honan, if you come across it. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. And, and you're working at a AWC property up there. Yeah, so I was based out of Mornington Wildlife Sanctuary, and at that time... Uh, the Australian Wildlife Conservancy had four different properties uh, and then added a, a fifth out there that they worked across and, and they've expanded even more with partnerships with Defence and the um, Aboriginal corporations out there. So huge areas to work across and a lot of the issues up there were about fire management and and we were, I was there with my partner doing his PhD on feral cats at the time. We were part of a big collaboration to understand why mammals in the north had suddenly started to decline. So this was picked up maybe 20 years ago. There was all these indications of all these mammals that have been doing fine in the tropics for, for years, despite all of the collapses we've seen in the south. Suddenly the northern ones were looking really shaky uh, and nobody really knew why. So we were trying to find the pieces to that puzzle. Uh, and it, it's an ongoing thing, but it seems to be a matter of a combination of too much fire or fire at the wrong times. Um, overgrazing in some places, basically reducing the cover, and then feral cats having more of an impact than they would have otherwise on all of those little native mammals. So, yeah, interesting times. Do mm. cane toads impact feral cats? Uh, not that we know. I, there's, I mean, we know there's a few native animals that are learning not to eat toads and so on, so I reckon cats are smart enough not to go there. <laughs> Damn. Mm. Well, they're going to be so smart. Could put more up there, couldn't we, to control More cane toads, yeah. That's <laughs> It's a really good idea. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, our recovery. Mm. If people want to visit, is that a thing people can come and like? Recently, totally. researchers and students can, but mm-hmm. they can. Yeah, no, we we open the gates to the public in um, little sunset tours. So, in the cooler months, you can book in through the Roxby Downs Visitor Information Centre and uh, go on a, a tour with one of our people. So they'll they'll take you out to watch the sunset, have a good chat, walk around. It's pretty casual. Uh, and then we'll go spotlighting and see what we can see. Well, so we need to do that, Adrian. We'll have to do mm. it. To get up there. That'd be good. Yeah. That'd be good. Yeah, I'd like that. Um, and just because um, Steve's... Steve, Steve, come back. I'm going to ask her now. <laughs> Reptiles. <laughs> Reptiles. <laughs> I know you're a mammologist, but you must come, a, come upon the we odd sure reptile. Do. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the Arid Zone is fabulous for reptiles, like super diverse. Uh, and we do a, a big pitfall trapping survey every year that's gone on for a quarter century now, as of wow. this year, which is pretty cool. So it's very awesome data sets there. Uh, and, yeah, lots and lots of skinks, dragons, geckos, and some really interesting trends like inside and outside the fence and over time. So, for example, the um, the larger skinks and dragons are more abundant in the fence where they're protected from feral cats that prey on them, whereas things like little geckos, uh, little loristas, little tiny little mm-hmm. sand slider skinks, they're less abundant inside generally because the bilbies and the bandicoots have a go at them. So <laughs> there's a real mix of winners and losers and so on. It's really interesting. And maybe some of the larger monitors and dragons eat them too. Yeah, so there, there's some indications and, and some earlier work that suggests there are more goannas on the inside, um, in some cases more snakes. So, yeah, there's just that much more prey for them. The hopping mice have gone bunter in there ever since the fence went up, so there's an awful lot of food in there for things that like to eat rodents. That's fascinating. Um, yeah, you've got pygmy mulga monitors and sand monitors. Yes, yes. What about the soil? Sorry to stay on reptiles. <laughs> oh, God. Just, a, just when you said it inside. Is that question, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, do you get many pythons up there? Ooh. Was there something that happened with Woma pythons? Can we talk about yeah, that? Yeah, we can talk about that. Um, so more than 10 years ago, there was an effort to bring Woma pythons back. And they, that species it would have been in the region. There's still occasional records around about, but um, they seem to have struggled a bit in the last oh, several years. So we brought some captive bred ones uh, out. They were fitted with radio trackers and followed for, for a while, but most of them ended up in the bellies of mulga snakes, which was wow. not expected. <laughs> um, I suppose the lesson from that is oh, maybe captive bred pythons didn't have the smarts to avoid mulga snakes. And also they weren't quite as fully grown as they could have been. Maybe they were more vulnerable for that reason as well. We actually looked at, in recent years, having another go with like big, wild womers. Um, 
but uh, we've since had a few records of, in other places of walnut pythons getting tangled up in fences like ours, and we thought we might not be the best place to preserve these snakes, so uh, we'll leave that to others and open landscapes. So you must have quite a few mulga snakes up there, or were they just a couple that knew it off? They've just let some womas go, so that's us sorted for a little while. Yeah, well, there's definitely more mulga snakes in there than mm. um, outside. The surveys have suggested that, so I guess there's a bit more... Um, yeah, it's a bit harder there for womas. Because mm. it's actually a huge place. It was 124 square kilometres. That's right. That right. Yeah, yeah. It, it is a big area. That's huge. <laughs> it's about 10 kilometres by 20 yeah, ish like, in an yeah. odd shape. <laughs> and it's divided into six different paddocks, which is actually really significant because it gives us a lot of experimental power. We can have animals in one paddock but not another, and you can compare the impact they have on the ecosystem. Uh, it sounds easy, it's actually a lot of hard work. <laughs> so, mm. for example, those um, western quolls that we brought in, we wanted to keep one paddock quoll free so that we could understand what the impact the quolls have on the ecosystem as a basically a top mammalian predator. We we're expecting our wolves of Yellowstone and all of these terrific <laughs> cascades and uh, everything would change right down to the plants and the bugs. Uh, and that story is still unfolding, but it's been challenging keeping the quolls out of our quoll free area. So the, the fence is cat proof, but it's not 100% quoll proof. <laughs> and we've tried a few retrofitting things and uh, had to work out what's going on with all the little female quolls that uh, seem to disperse. Uh, at a certain stage in their life cycle and a, a few of them end up in our qual free area so we're working on that um, but hats off to them they're very skillful and very agile just come back to the mulga snakes <laughs> do they eat things like bilbies and bedhogs not while there's womas there no <laughs> <laughs> i don't actually know um that'd be a good study to do actually to find some mulgas and see what they're hunting i'd say principally they're going after the rodents because there's an awful lot in there that's the easiest thing to go for but i'm sure there's the odd probably little bandicoot another thing that falls foul of a mulga it would happen mm. what sort of bandicoot you have western bar is it uh, we did yes and then its name changed <laughs> oh it's shark bay <laughs> yeah yeah so interesting little taxonomic story at the the western bar bandicoot was some um, re-analyzed so all of the museum specimens and things were looked at um with morphometrics and genetics and uh, the taxonomist pulled pulled them into five, I think it was five different species um, One, the, only one of which it still exists the others are all extinct and that one just lived in a little corner of, of WA so when we brought the what we thought was the Western Barred Bandicoot to Arid Recovery, we'd actually introduced it to a new area as it turns out but anyway, it's been doing its thing <laughs> for 20 years or so So uh, is it a new happily. species or is it a subspecies? A new species, oh. yeah, yeah. Huh. Hmm. Bloody taxonomy. <laughs> but, that, but they added four more to our extinct. Yes, they did. Animals. Yes, <laughs> yes. So they're doing that a there lot. You go. They've done that with um, pig-footed bandicoots. Now there's like a northern, that's right, and a southern, which is divided into an eastern and western subspecies. Mm. This is the same dude out of the WA Museum. Trevelyan has been working on the pig-footeds now. Oh, man, I'm so sad we lost the pig footeds. That would have been amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a, a friend who works at a natural history museum in London, and he reckons the pig footed bandicoots were on their way to being a marsupial hoofed animal, um, which is a crazy thing because if you think about marsupials, they have to you know, be birthed as a tiny jelly bean thing and then climb their way into the mm, pouch. So you're quite limited. So if, you have, if you're evolving to have hoofed, hands how do you have hands that can grasp your way into the pouch and then form into these little trotters um, yeah. and yet the pickford of bandicoot did so we'll never know mm. i guess they could mm. grasp with their two toes maybe <laughs> <laughs> or just squirm just worm squirm. like yeah. i don't know <laughs> <laughs> um no it's interesting like steve said we, we're, we're gaining more extinct animals as we as we learn more about the different mm. species that existed but the good news is you're helping to save the ones that are still here. Well, yeah, it's, you've got to work with what you have. <laughs> um, yeah, cut the losses, as, as it were, and do what you can with what's left. Do you have soft release up there too, where they come out of your fenced areas? Or? Yeah, so the, the quolls do that and they climb over the fence yep. and head out. Um, but other little things like um, the hopping mice and another little threatened rodent, rodent the plains mice, they, they disperse out through the netting. And the plains mice are cool, actually, because they 
were rare in the broader landscape, but they actually rocked up um, in 2006. They turned up inside the reserve and, and then went, oh, this is pretty good, and spread out and occupied more habitat um, types than they do outside the fence. They kind of relaxed the, the niche um, because they weren't under pressure from, from things like feral cats. So that's pretty nifty. Mm, that's uh, so interesting. Mm. Do you still get some feral cats appear mm. the wrong side of the fence? Do you have to keep an eye on that? Yeah, or? we certainly do. So the, the fence is largely cat-proof, but the occasional cat, if you give it enough time, will work out how to get over the floppy top. Um, so to deal with that, we're always controlling cats around the perimeter. So we've got traps open all the time. Um, we have shooters that get around. We've got a Felix a grooming trap that targets cats um, and not, not anything else. So, yeah, we have to keep that pressure off. And the, the main goal is that we, we don't want cats to be patrolling long enough to figure out how to get in or say we have a rain event and there's a hole under the fence that we want fewer cats walking around it that are going to get through that hole. But, yeah, Because that's work. a lot of fencing to go around. Yeah, the, like, the perimeter's 50 kilometres. Yeah, so, so you said when bit? you worked at, well, when you were manager at Warrawong, you'd, you'd do a loop. Every day. Most, yeah, every day you'd walk around. You couldn't really do that every no, day. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, we drive it a couple of times a week. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it takes but a But you've got internal mm. fences as well, not just the... That's I guess right. the perimeter is the main one, but... Mm. That's the highest priority, yeah. but, yeah, we have to keep an eye on the internals as well. Uh, and, yeah, one of the problems you know having been around for a few years now is that a lot of the fence is aging and rusting so where it's in contact with the soil and they're particularly aggressive soils where we are uh, and throughout a lot of the arid zones so we've been doing some research with a collaboration of soil scientists and metallurgists to understand like why does the fence rust so quick and what can we do about it um, so we've actually been testing a few things like uh, stainless steel which is a fair bit more expensive but uh, it it appears to last much longer, uh, so it's actually worthwhile if you can raise the funds to use stainless instead of regular galvanised metal. Um, it'll be more cost-effective in the long run, so we're trying things like that to get ahead of the game. Do you have to revegetate within the fence as well for the, to bear in mind the animals you're going to put in there? Mm. Does it take a lot of revegitate? Just me asking about plants, Adrian. <laughs> yeah, this is good. This is good. <laughs> <laughs> We've come a long way. We're so happy right now. Oh, good. <laughs> so, so proud. Yes. So proud. Draw them in. Get them into it's, take, it's taken nearly five years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, um, I, I love that kind of attitude. Of, oh, I guess plants are valuable. Animals eat them. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, no, we actually haven't had to do any revegetation. Like the landscape there was never cleared, and it was only relatively lightly stocked for a, a shortish period. Um, so it's fairly intact in that regard. But um, the, actually, the the main reason that arid recovery was set up in the first place was to deal with rabbit issues and um, when Khaleesi virus first decimated the rabbit populations in, in the arid zone and throughout a lot of Australia in the 90s, it was the opportunity to actually fence them out of an area forever um, because rabbits cause huge damage to arid zone vegetation particularly and prevent the recruitment of some of those really long-lived plants like mulga, uh, which is a pretty important part of the ecosystem for your pygmy mulga monitors, among other things. So having removed rabbits, we found has actually made a big difference to those things regenerating. Although we then found that uh, if you have too many betongs, you can reverse that trend, which is what we had in the sort of about the 10 year mark. The betong population really took off and um, they started to chew through the vegetation in a similar way to rabbits and, and other, other effects on some of the more sensitive vegetation. So that was a real tricky thing to manage when you've got an overabundant threatened species. You can't give away hundreds or thousands of animals. Where are they going to go? Uh, culling them is a problematic idea and mm. uh, yeah so, so that's one of the main reasons we brought quolls in to stabilise the ecosystem with a predator uh, so we're, we're still seeing how that works but the betongs now are at a, a stable level thankfully and we're seeing some good recovery of the vegetation after a bit more rain Wow! Do the quolls tend to take out the older uh, maybe compromised animals or young animals? Or? Are they lazy? <laughs> <laughs> it seems not. So we we didn't really know how it was going to go down. We we hoped that quolls would control betongs, but we thought oh, maybe they'll just take the young ones. They might go down the betong warrens and um, and attack the small betongs. Um, but we've seen that. The, even a, 
adult female quoll, which is smaller than the males, will take down a betong of the same size, if, if not slightly larger than she is. So they're pretty effective predators. Got any videos of any of these girls happening? <laughs> Unfortunately, no. We've got some interactions <laughs> on camera trap, which are kind of fun. But, yeah, hard so, to get. yeah, it is hard to get. I don't want to so. sound macabre, but I mean, just, <laughs> you know, those nature docos. Oh, awesome. absolutely. It's yeah. all creating awareness, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> <laughs> pretty well. Yep. What do they say? Nature's red in tooth and claw, and yeah, it sure yeah. is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I'd, we're keen to find out a bit more about the impact calls have. Um, one, one thing that we've seen in our Qual free area compared to the other is um, we have fewer of the bandicoots now where the quals are, so they're definitely chewing through some of those. Because um, they're yeah, smaller we'll than the betongs, aren't they? They are smaller than the betongs, yeah, yeah so they're probably a bit easier prey. Uh, yeah, it's an evolving picture. Okay. Well, yeah, you don't think of those things like you, you, you create this um, this area and and give the animals the best chance to succeed, then, then you, you do get that dilemma that Absolutely. Crap, we've got too many animals in here. Even <laughs> yeah. though it's huge, it's you know, yeah. absolutely massive. Totally. It's... And I think like it's a lesson in just how dynamic ecosystems are. Like there's no you know, set and forget about it. <laughs> and while all of these creatures coexisted in some form before European settlement, we don't really know what that looked like and how it changed over time. And there's, there's so many variables. There's the rainfall, there's... Um, yeah, what, what the other mix of species are doing and what sort of vegetation's in the mix. and Natural climate yeah, change. Climate change. Mm. <laughs> yeah, so it's uh, it's fascinating. And uh, the key to managing a reserve like Arid Recovery is having really solid monitoring data uh, so you can understand what you're looking at in the context of what's happened before uh, and also across you know, controls so you can see what's, what's differing between paddocks and try to isolate what's making what's driving the change and then see what you can do about it. So once upon a time thylacines would have hunted those betongs and mm. then they got displaced theoretically by the dingo. Um, so that's kind of the big guy missing from the landscape, that kind of yeah. medium-sized predator. Yeah, that's true. So, I mean, there, there were no dingoes within the reserve. There, there was uh, a cool experiment that was done in a place called the dingo paddock at the top of it. Um, but uh, the reserve itself is probably too small for dingoes to range across. Um, we did look at that when we had our betong issue. Could we put some dingoes in <laughs> temporarily? Um, but also fraught with challenge. We, we literally sit on the dog fence. Uh, it runs, it bisects the reserve. Uh, and technically, you can't really put a dingo south of the dog fence. Just on the wrong side of the dog fence. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. You, you could probably get permission to, because you could get permission to have a pet dingo if you mm. wanted to jump through all the hoops through Yes, Pazza. I think you're right. It, it would just be a lot of serious hoop jumping. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> have the, the, the pens where you've put quolts, have the, an, the other animals in there, have they... Have they had to relearn to be afraid of predators or were they yes. all right with that anyway? Yeah, well, um, we've got a PhD student who's looking at that at the moment um, out of the Uni of New South Wales. And, yeah, the key question is, like, that paddock that we put uh, cats back into, we really want to know if quolls can have the same effect of stimulating these behaviours in the prey animals that make them smarter about predators. Um, there's some indications that quolls have a, a bit of an effect but it's it's really tricky doing this research that's behavioral stuff you need a lot of samples because there's so much noise in the data um and it can be pretty hard to interpret sometimes too so hard yakka for those students <laughs> so mm. the jury's out we've got to keep working on that question mm. Mm. are you finding a lot of interest from the universities to come and be involved yeah no there's a fair amount of interest i think the um the challenge for us is we're pretty remote so getting people out and supported out where we are with vehicles and all of the costs involved in running research out where we are adds up but um yeah we've got more than enough interest and, and lots of students that are keen to do work with us and we've just got to pull things together i remember last time when nathan mm. came on he said you guys had just turned 21 and he said we can we're officially an adult now which i thought was funny <laughs> <That is cute. laughs> so gives an idea how long ago that was um what's nathan been up to yeah, so Nathan's been over in Perth, um, gallivanting through the Pilbara and stuff, doing um, some really interesting consulting work and research. I think he's been chasing western ringtail possums through the Perth suburbs and Critically so endangered. on, which is great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, he's also been involved in this new little outfit called Team Kawari, which is trying to raise the profile of 
an animal called the kawari uh, and raise funds to uh, support its research and conservation. Uh, so that's been getting some nice progress in recent years. They're like a little mini quoll type thing kind or a of, big yeah, dunnard? Yeah, they're or... somewhere between a dunnard and a quoll, you could say, and they live in this amazing landscape out in the top corner, southeastern corner of South Australia and bottom southwest of Queensland on the Sturtstony Desert. And that country, like, I really think it literally looks like the surface of Mars. It's just <laughs> red rocks and the odd little sand blip <laughs> and so, to the horizon, just an amazing landscape and these critters live out there and have a half-decent life. But um, they've contracted. They used to be across a much wider area into the bottom of the Territory and down into the Flinders Ranges. So, um, yeah, the, the research work on them at the moment is trying to uncover what's driving the, that declining trend and what we can do about it. Uh, and hopefully, maybe this year... Well, next year we'll have some quarry at Arid Recovery uh, as we work on a reintroduction program for them uh, and that will hopefully clear up a bit more of our understanding of them, how are they going to go if we put them somewhere where they're relieved from predation pressure, from introduced predators, uh, how flexible are they going to be in terms of habitat. We've got a bit of that gibbery country in the reserve, but there's a lot of sand dune as well. Are they going to use that? What are they going to eat? Are the quolls going to eat them? Yeah, so many questions. <laughs> Can't wait to meet them. That's so exciting. Mm. Yeah. So that's a potential new species for Arid. Yes, yeah, all going well, it, it will be. Uh, and I guess what, whatever we find out will be useful for um, for that species and hopefully if they do well, we'll have enough to give away and repopulate areas in the wild and, give and away. secure them. Can I put my name down for some Carraris? <laughs> Steve, do you want some Carraris? Yes, please. Apparently. So if you do want Carraris, uh, can we just get your phone number? We'll <laughs> swap you for Woma Pythons. <laughs> <laughs> mm, mm. <laughs> they don't live long, though, do they? Little Dazzy Eurids. They're fairly short-lived, yeah, yeah. 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 But that said, um, oh, in the like, 80s, they were quite popular in captivity. Apparently, um, one of the people on our science panel, his dentist had one. <laughs> people had Carraris and Mulgaras, and they were breeding them and, you know, you get complacent because, mm. like, I've got some, he's got some. And then you, a year later, if nobody breeds them, yeah, gone, they, they fizzle out. I'm always worried that'll happen with fat-tailed dunnarts, which are pretty mm. much the only small carnivorous marsupial in captivity now. And, yeah, right. Um, we can't afford anyone getting complacent with them because they'll go the same way. And mm. then to get them back, you've got to go out and trap a couple of hundred and start up again. Yeah. And who wants to do that? Yeah, interesting. Because I thought I could get permission to get a take permit and set up a colony for breeding something like a striped-faced dunnart. Mm. But then I've thought, well, why? What's the point? Yeah. We've got fat tails, we can talk about dunnarts, but we don't want to lose them. No, absolutely not. So, yeah, and that, that's the nice thing about the work that you do, having those animals on hand to show to people that would have, probably a lot of them have no idea these things existed. So it's an essential service, what you're doing. Thank you. Do you guys do any um, educational stuff like that up, up at Arid? Yeah, we do heaps, so, um, particularly in the local community of Roxby. So we're always in and out of the schools and, and getting kids out on excursions. We do a lot of snake awareness. So we have a our, our remaining worm of python. <laughs> she wasn't part of that introduction, no. She's, she's our ambassador for snakes, so we take her out to the schools. and um, You should have just... a mulga for that. <laughs> 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 yeah, not so keen. <laughs> uh, but no, she's good, especially because a lot of people that come to Roxby, they've come from Adelaide, they're not used to living uh, with snakes so closely, um, and so we use her as a, a way to show people how snakes behave, how to be safe around them when they turn up in your backyard, and to please not chop their heads off. That's brilliant. Hmm. Do you have any um, thoughts about living in the arid country? Like you, you've kind of come from New South Wales. Mm. Pros and cons? Yeah. Uh, you can roll out your swag and you won't get rained on, so that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and, and it's it's big sky country, so I do like that. You've got so much space as a landscape. It's, it's beautiful and the, the colours are amazing. Um, I suppose the other thing that Arid Zones taught me is patience uh, when we're in the Kimberley it's this annual cycle of um, you have the wet season it just dumps with rain there's waterfalls everywhere everything grows and then it dries and then it burns and then it rains again um, whereas coming to the arid zone you're walking around and you don't want to tread on any plants because some of them are like 300 years old because they're <laughs> so slow growing and so fragile and I went as we went through the, the big drought years of 18 19 you didn't know when it was going to rain. Uh, the country looked awful. We had lots of animals declining. Um, but you know it's going to rain eventually and it does come around and, yeah, you, you have to grow very patient with that cycle 
it's a very long running one. So you can go for long periods without significant rainfall? Absolutely, yeah. So I think it might have been 2019, we had 30 mils of rain wow. in the year. That was it. <laughs> my, um, my admin person at the time, she'd visited the UK where she's from and came back with a jar of rain <laughs> from a week <laughs> of rain in the UK that was oh, like 10 times more rain than we'd had in the whole year. How rude. <laughs> it was a bit cheeky. What are some of the adaptations, some of the animals like that survive on virtually no rain? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess yeah, all the animals are incredibly efficient in their water use, so they don't need to drink. They can get their water from their food, whether it's plants or animals, and um, that they'll drink if they get the opportunity to, but they can just about manage without it. So that's pretty cool, and they'll have adaptations like really concentrated urine, uh, which is what the stick nest rats use to glue their nests together, by the way. Concentrated urine. Mm. You go, I was just wondering what to do with all that concentrated urine I've got up in the shed, Steve. <laughs> Make a nest, yeah. you know. Get yourself a new house. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And things like um, you know, bilbies, those gorgeous long ears, uh, super thin and soft um, and full of veins. So their purpose is to cool the bilby down so they'll cycle blood through the ears where the air flows better and just shed heat that way. So there's pretty cool adaptations out there. That's very cool. Mm. That would cost a lot of money to keep somewhere like uh, Arid Recovery going. Yes. Is it hard to get that money? How do you get the funding for yeah. it? Yeah. Oh, well, we've been Don't mention your GoFundMe page. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. So, that's all right. Pa- Patreon. <laughs> Haven't said I'm a Patreon. Um, <laughs> no, well, Arid Recovery is really fortunate to have had... Um, a few major supporters over a really long time, which is somewhat unusual. Uh, in fact, we're, we're a bit unique in having a major partnership with a mining company. So BHP is our major sponsor, um, and we actually, the reserve sits on their land near the Olympic Dam mine out of Roxby. Um, they've been behind us the whole way. Um, we wouldn't be around if they, they weren't there. That's great. So that's mm. been fantastic. Uh, and then we, we also get a bit of support from the state government, uh, and more recently we brought on Bush Heritage as a partner, uh, and they've been fabulous as a bigger NGO. There's so many skills and things we've been able to tap into with them and some cool projects that we're doing together. So that's been good. Um, otherwise, good. yeah, lots of support from the research sector with our students that come up and help and, and academics that collaborate with us, uh, and then we raise a bit of money through our tourism programs and uh, and donations, so mm. that keeps us afloat. That's really, really good. And if people want to get involved and donate, they can just go to the website. Go to the website. Yes, we'll put that a, Google Arid Recovery, that. and you'll find us. Bush Heritage have a property called Bon Bon up that way, don't mm, they? They do. Yeah, it's a lovely salt bush and mile country. Yeah, really beautiful place. So we've been doing a bit of work across there with them. Um, they're really interested in new ways to manage rabbits and what that what that can mean for the landscape, tackling buffalo grass uh, and that sort of thing. The next big mm. problem, or yeah, John, the big problem that's here already. Yeah, John yeah. came on the show, John Reid, obviously our recovery, yeah. uh, came on the show and talk, talked about buffalo grass. He came on He came on to talk about the Felix or two. You mentioned the Felix yes. a, a while ago to control cats on the outside of the mm-hmm. fence, and that's a fantastic little machine too, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it's a very clever thing. Um, Yes, so that, that's John Reed's invention. Um, it's just amazing. He uses, like, LiDAR to detect the gait and shape and size of an animal to say what's not a cat and what is a cat. That's right. And it can tell the difference between a cat and a quoll, which are pretty similar, really. Yeah, are. yeah. It's, I mean, it's one of those things that's undergone an awful lot of testing. Um, a couple of years ago, we had 30 of the units in one of our paddocks for the big field trial, so we had a few cats in there with collars on all these Felixes set up and watched what happened. And, yeah, it was very effective. Um, didn't fire on any non-target animals and knocked off a few of those cats. So, so I think good. The 30% of the cats over a, about a month, I think. Just sprays a little bit of poison on the cat and then they groom themselves. And That's right, yeah, because cats like to be clean. Um, so the machine fires this gel with the poison in it and then the cat will lick that off. Yeah, so when do you think we're looking at breeding up some Kararis to try to reintroduce to Arad? Uh, well, we're, I'm meeting with uh, Zoos SA folk tomorrow to scope out our options there. You know, it's certainly, as you know, not easy looking for after animals in captivity and so they've got so lots to work out in terms of how to hold them and what to feed them and all of that. Uh, and also we're hoping that, at least for our, our reintroduction in the near future, that there's enough animals in the wild for us to take directly and release them into the reserve. 
Uh, but if not, uh, we will hope to support that with some captive breeding to get the numbers up. Uh, and there's others that are planning to do things with kawaris in future, so the, the state government folk are looking to move them to national parks they've been lost from right up the top near the eastern shores of Lake Eyre, western, western shores of Lake Eyre, way up there. So, mm. yeah, there should be a bit more work happening with the kawari in the near future. We've also been part of a process to get them uplisted from vulnerable to endangered uh, under the, the Federal Act because, they're, yeah, they're definitely, the data suggests that they qualify and that will give them a bit more protection and uh, hopefully a bit more money flowing their way. Do you work with AWC at all? Yeah, yeah. actually, next month they're coming to take a bunch of plains mice to establish in the, the Pilliga Reserve in New South Wales. So we have shared animals around a little bit, which has been cool, um, and, yeah, collaborated on some wider projects uh, about how you manage fence reserves and what species need protecting, where the gaps are and that sort of thing. That's so great. If you all work together, like you, you're going to make less mistakes or, or not, you know, <laughs> not everyone makes that same that's mistake. Like you're yeah, one yeah. of them to make it and then that's it. Yes, you don't want <laughs> the same, same mistakes being made twice. No. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah, it gives security, doesn't it? If something happens mm. here, you haven't got all your Carraries in the one basket. Yeah. The totally. yeah. <laughs> I think mean, that's the actual sound. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a lot of how we see what, what our recovery has to offer like as, as just one reserve. Um, we, I guess we can afford to be a bit nimble and try some crazy stuff like putting cats back into parts of it uh, so that others don't have to wear that risk and, and whatever we learn can then be useful. Love it. Brilliant. Love it, I yeah. Love that. that was yeah. awesome. Um, Catherine, so, thank you so much for taking your time to come on. That's been fun. My pleasure. Awesome really stuff. Um, love what Arid Recovery do. Um, and we hope to come up there. Maybe we can do another one up mm. there at Arid Recovery. Maybe when there's good. some kawaris. Love to get up there. Yeah, for sure. Yes. That'd be good. I really enjoyed all the reptile bits. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> have to come in summer, Steve. Yes. <laughs> Needed more plants, but anyway. <laughs> it was me who asked the plant question. <laughs> yeah. I asked the reptile question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're swapping. We're learning, aren't we? Yeah, it's pre I'm sure now. Um, <laughs> no, it was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much. And guys, thank you for listening. <laughs>